You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Guys, thanks for uh, tuning in again. Uh, the last two weeks, actually the last few weeks, Ryan, have been pretty big episodes. Uh, a lot of support, a lot of love out there. Uh, I love that people are subscribing and uh, you know, not only coming to the show because of a certain guest, but going, hey, I like that. I'd like to listen to some more interviews, even if I don't know every person. Or So I, I appreciate everybody out there. And uh, yeah, that's nice. Uh, how was your week, bud? Good? Same, you know, hanging up. <laughs> Same, you know. Yeah. Well, this will have aired a few days after when we're recording this right now. Mm -hmm. But I posted something because I am convinced I saw a UFO. I know. You saw the picture, the video. Did you? Did you? It's odd. It's it's okay. So what? There's no noise. There's flashing lights that go sort of like in a like a triangular round, and, and a then triangular. around. Right, right. I I mean I I have never seen anything like it. I mean my first thought is always drone these days. Yeah, but the, the, why well, I put up a drone in it, it, the skies are opaque with all the smoke and shit. The the air quality. I don't think at eleven thirty at night there's going to be some drone above my house. I don't know who, who buys drones. I don't know who buys drugs. Anyway, it was crazy. I was outside. My I was watching my dog taking shit because that's what I that's how I roll. Mm -hmm. And um, and I look up. And I go, "What the fuck, Shira?" My friend Shira stopped by, and uh, said, get my phone. And I used her shitty phone. She might as well have had a flip fucking phone. You know those flip phones? <laughs> it's brutal. I'm like, dude, update, do something. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, you know, this week, the last two weeks, I felt bad because. You know, I, I sort of, you know, told, I just, I, I said what was going on in my life. You know, it was like, you know, the skin cancer. Then last week, my sister passed away. And again, it was, this show is, is, is like that. I can't not share that information and, uh, um, everything, you know, it's nice this, this week, I think, you know, my dad's, I'm sure there's some sort of relief, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, cause my sister was six for so long and, um, but you know. I've been talking to him every day, and uh, I think you know he'll he'll get he'll get he'll get better and better. You just have to know there's always tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so everything else is is fine. Uh, again, thanks to all the patrons out there. If you don't know what Patreon is, uh, it's extra support for the show, and you get a bunch of stuff like uh, inside of me. You get to ask me questions, and I make videos and answer your questions. And then there's shit talking with guests. You get to ask guest questions, and then there's occasional zoom or there, there's a, a live youtube for just the patrons and a bunch of stuff there's a lot of fun stuff great community and i couldn't do it without you guys um they've been around for a while and um so if you want to join patreon check it out i think you'll really enjoy it and uh, certain tiers get merch boxes every four months which is oh fun maybe it's every three months i don't know so i just packed boxes yesterday i do it i make i write these little notes hand handwritten my hand gets fucking tired after fucking three of them. I'm like, I got 20 left to do today. I have to take breaks because I don't hand, you don't hand write. You don't write. do that anymore. You yeah. don't do that. No. But I was putting things in the box and I got new merch for, you know, because when they get like, they're a dedicated patron, you know, and mm -hmm. so they get the little box personalized thing from me and they get cool shit. So I think people are digging it. And they always have ideas, these patrons. They always, and some of them are really good. They're like, you know, you should do inside of patrons. I'm like, well, how would that work? That just seems it seems like more work for me, doesn't it? <laughs> more work for Ryan, uh, you know. But it was a good idea. Um, I'll have to figure it out. But like, sort of like asking people how the podcast has changed their lives, like on Patreon. Mm -hmm. Maybe ask a, a certain patron every once in a while uh, a lottery where you know you film them and mm -hmm. you know just a couple minutes. How does it change your life and blah blah? blah you know, because uh, some people were really affected, and uh, so I appreciated it. I appreciate all of it. And remember to subscribe and uh, follow us at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram, at Inside of You Pod on Twitter. We have an Inside of You on Facebook as well, well at Inside of You Podcast or Inside of You Pod. You'll figure it out. A lot of good stuff on there. Stage It is this weekend. This coming weekend, Rob and I are doing another Stage It. It's right before we were going to a recording studio and, and record our album. So great prizes if you go to stageit.com. And type in Rosenbaum and Dance, and there's two shows next Saturday, the 26th of September. It's uh, uh, 2 p.m. and a 6 p.m. Tons of stuff. Autograph uh, band pictures and shirts and Zooms, and we play a song for you, and we'll send it to you. Just a bunch of great stuff. So go to stage.com and get tickets now, and uh, it's a live show, and it's a lot of fun, and thanks for the support. Today's guest, 
I've known her for since she was a young girl. I think she got Smallville when she was 17, and I was 25, 26. And, um, you know, we just became really good friends. In the beginning, she was too young, and I was old, eccentric guy. You know, I wasn't old, but... Um, you know, I was bald, weird guy, I guess. I don't, I don't, whatever I was, she and I created this sort of a bond. Like we became friends and it was really nice. And uh, I think she's a tremendous human being. I don't say this about a lot of people, but Kristen Kruk has a, such a strong awareness of who she is and who she aspires to be and what she wants to become. I mean, she just, she's always evolving and she's always, she's always working on herself. It seems like she's, she's always doing things for others, other young women. She, uh, she's a positive force. I think she really is a, is a great woman. She's got a lot to talk about. So I'm excited about that. Were you here for this recording? I was not. Oh, no. Well, hell with you then. <laughs> Ryan, uh, shout out right here to Ryan. Who's been, uh, doing some fantastic editing. Give Ryan a hand right here. See, there we go. There we go. I mean, he edits all the uh, you know the videos on YouTube, and then you could listen to him. And so he's uh, he's got a good ear, and I trust him. I don't even listen to the episodes anymore. I just I assume that you're going to just do a great job and protect me if I say something stupid, which is constantly. What? No, it's all perfect. No, it's I barely do anything. That's a lie. <laughs> uh, again, thank you everybody for all the well wishes for uh, just all those nice notes and all those things, um, and some of the cameos have been fantastic. And uh, we're doing some more virtual cons. Tom and I are doing a couple, so check out Instagram and and Twitter and all that stuff, and we'll let you know. But the virtual cons are fun. We're doing these Zooms, and they, they give you, I've said it before, they give you like two minutes to talk to someone. You know, they're like, hey, Michael, and they give you a button that you can go 10 extra seconds, 10 extra seconds. And I always do that. I shouldn't have told people down, but I, I do go over. If you do two-minute Zoom with me, you definitely get more than two minutes. I'll fucking tell you that right now. All right, let's get inside of the wonderful, talented, my former co-star. I hope I uh, get to work with her again someday. She's a joy. And uh, this is Kristen Kruk. Let's get inside of Kristen Kruk. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. You know, this whole thing, the whole COVID, the whole, you know, how the world is now. And I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I talk about, we talk about this on the podcast. I don't know. How do you do it? How do you react to this shit? I just, most of the time, I'm able to just move forward. Mm. Like I try not to get stuck in it. And I think that that's it. Like when I talk to people who really get caught up in it, it's like the difference between me and them in those moments is that I don't keep thinking about it. Like I just go, okay, that's just the way it is right now. And I can step back and not get completely invested. I'm not like that all the time, but with certain things that feel very out of my control, I am, I am. You let them go quickly. Yeah, I let them go. Why do I linger on them like a cranberry song? <laughs> that I don't know, Michael. Why do you? I don't know. I think because my mind's going a million miles an hour. I'm doing all these things. And um, it's not that I expect everything to be smooth sailing and and happen and, and be fine and be great. And I know there are things along the way. There are bumps along the road, on the road, whatever. But I, I, I think... I do get a little overwhelmed at things, it, it, you know, especially when, when that hits, when it's one thing after another, I try to do the breathing. I try and then all of a sudden I'm drinking a Coke. I'm uh, you know, I'm not exercising as much and I kind of go down and like, what am, what are you doing? And if you just kind of realize maybe that, Hey, stop, go back to the routine, go back to, mm -hmm. do you have a routine? Yeah. I was going to say though, I think a part of what I do too, though, is I don't overload myself. I don't like having a ton of stuff on my plate. And so I try and keep it so that I don't like, I don't like it when I have a, like I do get stressed out when I have a lot. So I kind of control my life a little bit so that I don't have those moments that you're talking about where it all piles on top of each other because then I feel like I'm scrambling and I can't keep up. So like part of how I manage it is I just don't have 
as many things that I'm doing. Like, I feel like you do a lot of things. Okay. I'm, I think you were caught in your first lie because you're going back to school. You're on a show. You, uh, you know, I, I mean, you do a lot of things, but maybe you are able to not spread yourself too thin and go, I could handle this. I could handle this. And when yeah, something yeah. you can't, right. Yeah. I, have a, I guess maybe it's more like I have a sense of what I can handle and I, and I don't push myself t- too far beyond what I think I can handle. That's good. Do you get annoyed easily? I mean, I know you do because you got annoyed with me sometimes on the set. <laughs> but do- sometimes, especially if I'm tired. Do you know? Hungry. Yeah. Or when you're hungry. That, yes. I, I get like that. We get We get hangry. But like you're dating someone. Do you uh, do you find yourself like, why? Why did I just get annoyed? Oh, I'm sorry. That was such a small thing you did. But for some yes. reason, it pissed me off. Absolutely. Especially during COVID. That's definitely it's more annoying. Like, why are you eating the cake while it's in the fridge? Why not remove it from the fridge and then eat the cake? This <laughs> isn't necessary. <laughs> to, oh, there's a printer going off in my office. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, the yeah. answer is yes. I, well, if I were him, I'd say, because I'm a guy. This is what we do. Not an excuse. I have an Arnold Palmer. It's a jug of Arnold Palmer iced tea. Of course, I live alone. It's different. But I open the fridge and I give a little chuggy chug because no one else is going to go in there and probably drink my iced tea unless they ask me. And then I'll say, hey, I just chugged on that. You might want to be. Right. But are you spilling your iced tea into the fridge? Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. So you're saying he's a little <laughs> bit messy. He spills cake in the fridge. It's really irrelevant in the grand scheme of life. But in the moment, at times, it can be annoying. I think what's funnier is the conversation maybe you have an hour later where you're like, um, sweetheart, I don't know if you call him sweetheart, maybe honey bunny, but perhaps you just say the cake incident. I mean, you're, you're a pig, but I shouldn't have reacted like that. And um, I'm sorry about the uh, cake fight. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't ever get to the fight, fight land, but definitely it is, a, it is strange. So you don't fight. I think we, we don't have like fight fights. Um, we'll like disagree or have an argument about something, but we don't like, I don't like, we don't have yelling fights. I can't imagine you yelling. I would love if just on this podcast, one time you just laid into me. Yeah, I won't do that. That's highly unlikely. You never yell. When's the last time you yelled at work? Cause it was in a scene. Oh, it was the writing. I like the, uh, so, so, so you were in a moment and you had to yell because it's written in your acting yelling. I've yelled in previous, in previous relationships, you know, it's come to yelling, um, but only if someone else yells first. Right. I mean, you you had a good upbringing. Were your parents yellers? No, they were, they were quietly punishing. Quietly punishing. That sounds like a song. When you say that you do something and in, in a very subtle way, not to say they could shame you, but they'll say something that's just. Oh, they know how to get under my skin without doing anything, much of anything. Yeah, but there were lots of rules in my household. You had to follow the rules. What were the rules? Please, you can't go out, you can't date people, you can't wear makeup, <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything. You can't watch certain shows if there's kissing in them. Well, didn't you kiss Tom on Smallville? Oh, that's different. That's when I'm older. When you're an adult, it's fine. There's so- rules when you're like, growing up in a household but you still live with your parents for uh until you were what 19 yeah but my parents are very interesting they they have a they're very clear like when a kid turns 18 they are an adult and when they're an adult everything stops they're they don't try and parent they don't get too involved they don't demand my time or my energy they're like you do your life We'll support you in the ways you want to be supported and we'll back off if you want us to back off. And I feel no pressure from that. Wait a minute. So it's like, when's your birthday again? December 30th. Right, December 30th. I wanted to say earlier December, but I'm glad you said it first because then I didn't look wrong. So on December 29th, they might have been kind of rude and said, you're, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And then the second you turn uh, 18, I let her leave her alone. Pretty much. That was their theory. And, and I'm really, as I said, see some of my friends and their relationships with their parents like I'm really glad that they did that like I just don't feel the weight of them at all did you feel that teenage angst did you feel that they won't let me do anything I want to do this did you ever find yourself yelling at them as a kid yeah of course 
I was I was an annoying child because I <laughs> called my parents. <laughs> I'm not an annoying adult. Um, I called my parents out on a lot of stuff. I would be like, "This is an inconsistent rule," and like, "What is the like?" Basically, I'd be like, "What's what's the basis of your rule?" And and if I'm upholding the basis of your rule, then am I not, not doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I'd get mad at them, and I'd have like big arguments about what I thought was uh, objectionable parenting. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> I wanted to do things, and I did. I found ways to do things, but I wasn't like a. The thing is, I always really saw myself as a responsible teenager. Unlike you were irresponsible teenagers, right? You were very. You're a, a responsible person, ultimately, right? I, yeah, I think I I try to be. Yes. Do you ever go back and say? Mom, dad, I want to say thank you for quietly punishing me over the years. <laughs> I have. I have said thank you. I mean, I've had some really interesting conversations. Becoming, choosing this profession has been weird because my, my, my parents don't understand why I would ever choose to be in the public eye. And, and oftentimes I don't understand why I chose that either. Um, and so it's been nice to be able to talk to them about those choices and how their parenting has allowed me to feel more grounded in that and to be able to make decisions that make me feel safe and comfortable as opposed to feeling like I need to constantly amass more, you know, shows as an actor or whatever it is. Did they give you that approval? Did they say, did they watch them all? Did they say, Hey, we're really proud of you. You're very talented. We liked watching the show. Good job. Uh, that sort of stuff that I didn't get. Yeah, I guess. But I, I think it, it was more for them. I mean, they watch the shows. I think partly it's because I don't live at home anymore and they just want to see my face. Right. Um, but my my dad was very clear with me actually recently, too. He was like, I'm not that he, he's not proud of things we do necessarily. It's more about how we are and if we're choosing things that are making positive impacts in our communities. Wow. So you learned a lot of that from them, from your dad. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad's, both of them are very engaged, but my dad was always heavily involved in, in our community. So he was a landscape, he is a landscape architect and he'd work on the parks board and just ensure that he was like engaged in the community um, on a very on the ground level so that the community itself would thrive and be better. That was important to him. Well, I felt, you know, I'm asking these questions because obviously, you know, it's therapy, but, uh, you know, when I grow, when I grow up, <laughs> you heard it, there was a, there was a slip. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I, I, I think there's an essence of that. I've definitely matured a little bit, not much, but you always want to get your father's approval. You want them to be proud of you. You want your dad to say, I love you. You want these things. Do you think that's something that you're really, after a certain age, you just didn't, uh, didn't need anymore? Is it something we all still sort of want for instance like when you're dating people did you want them to date someone that you liked that they oh sorry that they liked like my dad would like him i'm gonna date him because my dad would like him i think that is a part of it for sure i i even made a conscious decision in that way once i was like weighing options for myself and a part of it is like how well would my family get along with this person and would <laughs> they like them and do they have like values that are shared with with my with my family like that was important to me okay so th th we're so different in regard in that regard in a lot of regards the difference for me was can this person i'm dating could, would she leave me once she met my family <laughs> is there a possibility that she might say okay i could deal with it really you still you still like me you still want to hang out with me even though yeah you know th that was the opposite yeah i can understand why it would be different from i've never met your parents um but from everything that i hear like it doesn't it just sounds like we had very different different properties. yeah and look people grow i've talked about it my dad's growing i think my mom tries to make i think that you know what you can't change people you just can't this is who they are and uh if i you know as a young girl my parents are crazy or or if you're dating someone like i'm dating someone who she's just crazy right I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you, if you, it's all yeah. hypothetical. But if you continue to either try to change them or expect a different outcome, and you're you're crazier. 
You're someone's not just gonna go, oh, okay, I'm gonna completely be a different person now for you. No, never. I think it's unfair to them too. Like if if you're going like I like these aspects of this individual and I don't like these, so I'm gonna try and control them to be other than that then it's so unfair. There's probably a relationship or, or something for them somewhere else where they can be loved for who they are as a whole, not me being like, you have to be another way. <laughs> Your sister, did you have a great relationship growing up or was it sort of like sometimes maybe she wasn't even acting this way, but you felt like I had to kind of lessen how good Smallville is or important Smallville is or any work, Beauty and the Beast or whatever show you're working on, did you feel like you had to just kind of go, ah, it's not a big deal, whatever, let's not talk about it, because you almost, or with friends or anything, do you ever feel like that? I think we we inadvertently do that, don't we? Well, uh, I think, okay, well, with my sister, she's five years younger than me. She's in a very different profession. Um, I don't think she particularly likes my work. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. She doesn't like your work? She's told you, like, nah, I don't think you're good. She never said that. I mean, obviously, I'm me. I interpret all things to be slightly negative that may not be negative. Um, but I, it's not like, it's not important in our relating. Um, God, you're mature. So it's a little different that way. Like, I don't feel like I have to make something smaller because it doesn't feel like it's a big thing. That makes sense. That my friendships. Yeah. yeah. You don't seem like someone who wants to talk about, you want to talk more about school or a book or your relationship or art or like you just escape. You don't have to be always just enveloped by, you know, your work and all these, right? No, I love talking about the work and, and I love talking about what we can do and stories we can tell. And I like gossiping at the end of the day about people at work. I <laughs> like doing that, Good. but I don't feel like I need to do it with everybody. Right. I think for me, my, um, you know, my brother, my younger brother, he's always been like, we weren't, we didn't get along as kids. I mean, I wanted to kill him. I think I tried to kill him as a kid. Uh, he threw uh, pool balls, you know, those hard ball. He, he would throw TVs, whatever he had in front of him, he would throw at me. We didn't get along, but there came a point where I remember he was in college. And he's like, me and my boys are watching Urban Legend, man. We're so excited. And I was like, oh, that's cool. My brother's excited about what I'm doing. And even when I made this movie that made no money, but I busted my ass and shot a little movie in Indiana, he came and did it with me. He came and helped me out. And even yesterday, yesterday, I get an email with a screenshot of a picture from the movie. He's like, still love watching this movie. Man, so much fun. That just meant a lot to me. It's like, you know, just a little, little moments. Do you and your sister share that? Does she ever send a little moment like, oh, here's me and you. I miss you. I get, I have a, I have a nephew now. So I get videos of him that are adorable. He's at that age where, you know, when they're little and they have that hilarious giggle that is so contagious. So she'll send stuff like that. My sister and I were never, I mean, she was my little sister. You know, I read her books and sang songs to her. And what'd you sing? What'd you sing to her? God, I embarrassingly, I, as a teenager, young teenager, like 13 was obsessed with <sighs> Disney songs. So I would just sing her, like little mermaid songs or whatever Under which i still the know sea, all the words that to one? which i will not sing currently i know i know you're right i knew you're gonna say that i'm not gonna sing it <laughs> i knew that was gonna happen i don't think i've ever heard you sing. i don't know i think i've heard you sing like kind of like I can't sing, Michael. i'm a terrible singer i just remember you singing like for fun like hanging out like you know the song or you'd be just humming something or doing something and but yeah but you don't really like to sing but no one in your family was sort of um they weren't, you didn't live with extroverts. No, no, everyone's an introvert. I don't, my dad's the closest to an extrovert in my family. We are all introverted peeps. Hmm. So he didn't dance around in his underwear to make you girls laugh or like, oh, it wasn't that. God, no, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> He'd chuck us around. <laughs> like happily throw you around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's, I, I wanted to make that clear. All of a sudden, Kristen oh, Kirk's yeah, yeah, dad. Not, not like. Abusive, yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he threw us around. I'm like, holy crap. That's an excerpt. Someone who doesn't know you who just air. Yeah. Kristen Kirk's yeah. parents. Yeah. He just, they, he threw us around. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Inside of You is brought to you by Magic Spoon. You guys have to listen to this. Magic Spoon sent me four boxes, all right? I got them right here. I got the blueberry, all right? I got the cocoa. What else do I have? A frosted right here. Frosted, fruity. So I had them at my house. 
And my friend goes, whoa, what's that? My friend Ethan, who talks like that, whoa. He's going to get mad. but It's he a solid talk. Ethan. Solid Ethan. And Joe was over here. Tom, we were socially distanced. That's not important right now. I gave them tastings of each. I shizzle nizzle you not. <laughs> they were going nuts. They're like, dude, this tastes like, I don't want to say the name, or this tastes like, I feel young. Dude, I'm, I'm, I swear, you, you email Joe and Ethan and Tom. They were going nuts on Magic Spoon, which made me happy. I'm like, well, if they are a sponsor, maybe I can get a bigger discount for my friends. You know, growing up, cereal is one of the best parts of being a kid, right, Ryan? Oh, yeah. I mean, you just wanted to just, you couldn't wait to just down the fruity or whatever taste of, you know? All the big brand name stuff. All the big brand names. But we had to give it up because, you know, you realize it's full of sugar and crap and you just really shouldn't eat it, right? Yeah. The older you get. Oh, no, it's bad for you. So, you know, obviously I, I, I try to cut down on the carbs and the, and the sugars and all this stuff. And uh, I realized I can't eat anything anymore. But Magic Spoon. Mm -hmm. Zero sugar. 11 grams of protein, three net grams of carbs in each serving, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. Look at these beautiful boxes. It makes you feel like you're a kid again. Look at that. You can tell I've been destroying it because it's all ripped up already. Sorry, Magic Spoon. I can't be perfect for you, but I'm telling you, it's good. That's why the box was ripped open. It tastes amazing. It's honestly too good to be true. And um, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO free and still tastes freaking great. Go to magicspoon.com slash IOU. What is it, Ryan? Magicspoon.com slash IOU. That's correct. And grab a variety pack and try it today. You got to try the variety pack. You got to try them all. Be sure to use our promo code IOU at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason... They'll refund your money. No questions asked. I and mean, what's the problem, guys? Magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring our podcast. You're going back to school, and it's something I really admire because um, I, for one, just always try to get out of school. But you're back in school now. What are you studying? Okay, so I right before getting on this call with you, I just took my final exam for um, my art history class. Uh, but I'm just I'm working towards my bachelor's degree. It's it's something I sort of wanted to do since I graduated high school, but I was working, and it's just I'm going very slowly because I'm working as well. Um, but yeah, I I love it. I love it, and I don't have to go to class. I can do it all online. But you were going to class before this happened, right? No, I, I don't have to go. So Queens University does a full distance ed program. So everything is the same classes they offer on campus. They don't offer their entire course load, but you can select what you want and then just you work from home on the computer. And it's a joy. It means I can not talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> I can write essays on my own time. I'm really good at being self-directed, so it's perfect for me. You have no ADD. You have no, you're focused. You could, you could work for hours and not blink, right? Yeah, I'm very focused. You're a straight A student, admit it. Currently, I am a straight A student. Oh, <laughs> I gosh. wasn't always. In high school, I got, you know, it was mixed, but yeah. Currently, I am. But it, to be fair to everyone in the world, I take one or maximum three classes a term. Most students are taking over five. Would you have taken a class if it wasn't available online to go to class? Oh, I did. That's how I started this journey. When I was done Beauty and the Beast, I was like, I need to go to school. My brain feels drained. So I was doing um, continuing education at the University of Toronto, which is like basically me and 65 year old people learning about, you know, the Second World War or miss like uh, mythology or and I took a creative writing class. And all of that stuff I started and then I was like just flirting with the idea of actually working toward my degree and eventually I was just like why not I can take as long as I want and I love it and so I just started so 65 year old people are are, are pretty much the the, the the age range around 50 60s who you're going to class with no now that I'm in university well right I'm talking about when you went to class yeah when I was going to my continuing ed classes right. the people who go to continuing ed are retirees generally. 
So nobody recognized you. Oh, gosh, no. And you loved that. Yes. Because <laughs> if you would have gone with a bunch of people your age or younger, you probably would have to deal with, oh, hi, you're on that. and you it, Some, some, but the young, young ones, they don't really know me. So it's like a, it's a funny pocket. Like, because I'm working for my, for my bachelor's degree, it's really young people. They're like 18, 19, 20. They're, they're babies. Uh, and they don't know me as much. But honestly, I think sometimes when I go to take an exam, someone will recognize me. No one cares. <laughs> I care. I care. Did you ever decide that you wanted to learn another language? Because your, your dad's, uh, uh, your mom's Chinese. Yeah, my mom's of Chinese origin. She never spoke Mandarin or Cantonese. She only speaks English. My dad's of Dutch heritage, and he only speaks English. But in, in Canada, we take French for a long time. So I took French through high school, but I, I haven't practiced it in a long time. And you still love acting? Some of it I do, yes. Burden of Truth is what, third season? We're going into our fourth season. I, I go to work in two weeks. And you play a lawyer. Is that a lot of dialogue, a lot of tough dialogue? Yes, it is. It's a lot. I've basically become you. You were talking on one of our panels the other day about like learning your shit like weeks in advance. I am officially that person. I will sit. I've got like court scenes and they're normally through the middle of the night and I'll have the, uh, we are a block shooting like 10 pages and it's all me. Blah, 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 blah. I'll just sit there for weeks beforehand studying and studying and studying. It's just so much. And you're going to we school. No time. It's so stressful. I mean, going to school and learning all these things and trying to keep your grades up and then memorizing all these lines. And I mean, that's a lot. I mean, do you, I mean, do you stress? Do you, do you, do you, does someone help you with the lines? Mm, Eric will sometimes just read lines with me at home, but then he gets annoyed. <laughs> Why does he get annoyed? What is it? Well, no, because I mean, who wants to just read lines for hours on it? Yeah, Please. He will do it happily, but I just don't want to make him do it forever. Do you ever say, Eric, can you put a little effort into that? I feel like I'm talking to a recording. He does. He puts effort in. He this. acts. Is he trying to impress you or something? No, he just <laughs> likes to, I think. There's all those apps now, too, that you can put it onto your um, iPad or Yeah. With the record. Right. And it will say the lines, and then you say yours. And so you use that, too. Sometimes. Wow. Four seasons. Huh. I always I'm thought. My 20th season Wait, of television. My 20th season total of television as a regular. 20th. Because you did seven of Smallville. Seven of Smallville. Four. Five of a show called Edgemont. I did four on Beauty and the Beast, and this will be my fourth on this show. That's more than I've done. I think I'm probably at like 14. I got to catch up. Maybe. No, you don't have to. TV's, TV's a lot. You what don't seem like you're really that interested in <laughs> pursuing that actively. Well, I don't Who knows? But, you know, the uh, the whole virtual thing, we're in this virtual world now, so everybody's Zooming. And so you and I and Tom, we, we, we just did a uh, a Smallville virtual. How weird is that for you? It's very weird. Being on a panel in person is much easier because we can. I can see you guys weird. There's no lag. I can get a sense of what you're feeling or what's going on. When we're in this world, it's very difficult to figure out when there's a break in conversation. We can't use our bodies as cues to talk. The like guys, it feels very disconnected and strange. And there's no audience, so I can't tell if they're bored, if they find something interesting. Like there's just so much engagement when we're in person that we just can't have in, in this world. I really like when um, people are very forthcoming or very, uh, they take the initiative. They sort of say, hey, so blah, and they start asking stuff. Because have you ever had those uh, situations where someone just staring, sitting there looking at you and you're like, hey, how are you? Good. Okay. Uh, so, you know, sometimes those are hard. And I'm sure for me, I could I could do it because, I, you know, I, I just, like you know, me. But you, you know, you might have a little uh, tougher time doing that. You mean on the one-on-ones? Yeah, the one-on-ones. Yeah. I find most people I can just talk to them either I can, either they want to ask me questions or they just want me to talk so I will ask them where they are how they're doing these the time goes by very quickly and what I, are they, I find it yammering for a bit what what are, what's what are the questions you're asked on a repeated basis um 
I don't actually know the answer to that, which is weird. I can't think of a repeated question currently. I mean, you probably get a lot of Lana Lang questions, right? Yeah. Yes, I do. I get a lot of that. But some people know that I'm really, really excited about Burden of Truth. So they'll ask me about that because either they are legitimately fans or they know that I am a fan of the show. Um, and they'll ask me about scenes or about how I felt about certain storylines. But m mostly they want to tell me that they loved the show and how they felt about it and what it meant to them. And does that connect with you a lot? Because I know when you're caught up in it, we all are like, you know, uh, we're doing it where we don't understand the impact things can have, you know, and we feel like, oh, this is silly. It's just a TV show. People are risking their lives all over the world to help people. Those are the heroes, right? But then you're like, when you hear some of these stories, it, it you know, it's touching. Do you, are you ever, I mean, do you have to hold back emotion? Have you ever been emotional with someone's uh, sort yeah, of? Of course, more when, when we're in person with them. I think people feel more comfortable to be intimate in those situations. Maybe not everybody. Some people feel safe with the distance of the virtual, but yeah, I mean, and like, I feel, I, I feel what people are going through. I think that's part of communicating with other individuals and having any sense of what's going on for them. You've got to experience as much as you can what they're, what they're telling you they experienced. And that's, that is emotional for sure. Are you, what are you doing during this whole time of, uh, you know, the pandemic, are you, do you go out at all? Are you just mostly staying home or what do you, what are you doing and how are you, uh, what's your reaction towards it in terms of like how you're dealing with it? How are you dealing with it? Well, honestly, I, um, my life's pretty close to the same as it always is, but the difference is like, I, I miss little things. I miss going to the movie theater. I miss going to a restaurant. I miss kind of like being in the vicinity of other people. Like we live in cities for a reason there's something about absorbing the energy of that city. And I, I miss doing that. But what I've been most concerned about in my immediate community is the businesses that are around. So I've tried to support them. So in my, my day-to-day -day life, now we're quite open in this city. Like a lot of restaurants are opening up, blah, blah, blah. So I'll try and go and eat on people's patios. I don't want to go inside yet. Um, I support my gym, work out with them out in the park. Um, you know, I just try to engage in that way. Otherwise, I'm just at home. Why books. do you think Canada? Why do you think uh, you you're in you're in Canada, Toronto? Toronto, yeah. Why do you think it, things are working well there now? Why do you think in Canada everything's kind of working and opening? What do you think the reason is behind that? I think there's a bunch of stuff. I think our government never denied the fact that this was a real issue. I think that there's a little there's become more consistency in the messaging. I mean, obviously this is a new virus. We've never experienced it before. Science is constantly learning more and we have to change what we're doing based on that. Um, I think that we have less of this pull to the idea of personal freedom. And I don't know why that messaging started happening in the US. Like somehow your freedom is being impinged upon um but we don't we don't seem to have that same problem here not that we don't there are people who are protesting still um i don't know i i mean i do think a big part of it is like having government officials who are saying that it's real and that it matters and that we're in this together right there's just a mixed message here of like you know one you know the president's saying this and he's not wearing a mask so he's showing people that hey it's not a big deal and then his scientist is saying another thing but He's keeping him around, even though he doesn't agree with it. It just, it's kind of like a, you know, and I don't get political in here, but that's just the thing. It shouldn't be political. So it's just, it shouldn't be. And it's, and it's obvious what we should do and what we need to do. Like, I, I think the fact that it's become so steeped in conspiracy theories is, is so crazy. Well, the one thing that gets me and um, I just don't know how they could think this is all about um, the election. So we're compromising the health of the entire planet and every country so we could win an elect. It's the most asinine thing. I could understand the Russians rigging the whole thing. Or <laughs> that is fathomable. I'm not getting political. I'm saying it is not political. I feel like George C. Scott. It is not in the files. That's how he talked. I don't know if you know that. It is not. So, okay. So it sounds like you got shit going on. It's, it's You're together because there is just... I think everybody has come together in the the um the nation of Canada and they have said, "Hey, 
this is the deal. Let's wear masks. Let's be respectful. And uh, this will blow over as opposed to I ain't doing that. Yeah. And I think the other part of it, too, and this is changing right now a little bit, but the government supported people with money. We, people have been getting money during this time from the government so they don't have to feel the pressure to go back to work. Whereas I feel like you guys have been left in the lurch a little bit in that way. And for people to survive, they need to go back to the workplace. I, I think in both countries, we're dealing with a lot of, um, like you're seeing income disparity and there are certain people who don't have privilege and who do have to go to work regardless. But I do think Canada has financially supported individuals, which on the ground means that you don't, you, know, you really don't have to go and risk your kids' lives or risk your life by going out. I just want everybody to live. I want people that were, you know, I just want, uh, I want to get back to the way things were. And uh, in order to do that, sometimes you have to go against what you think is maybe, or maybe what you want to do. Like, you know, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. Sometimes that's what we do. We do that all the time in a relationship. You know what? I'm going to compromise. And if you don't compromise, the relationship's going to implode. Everything implodes when you don't compromise. And if you don't respect and love, it will implode. Things don't go right. Yes. Well, they don't go well. You plan to study forensic science. Is that because you love watching stuff that's really dark and cold case files and stuff like that? What is it that like you thought about that? I know you didn't do that, but what was it? I was interested in criminology mostly, and it was because I was interested in human psychology, which is the same reason I loved acting. Um, I was obsessed with understanding why people thought the way they did, what drove people to commit crimes or to, to be violent, or you know, just to exist the way they did at all. And I, I was very fascinated with understanding that aspect of human nature better. And that's why I really wanted to do that. But did you watch that dark stuff? Or are you kind of like, you don't go, you get I didn't, I didn't, when I was in high school, I, I wasn't really allowed to, I mean, I was interested in it. Like when I read books, I, I was interested in books that were, that explored a little bit more tumultuous emotions and, you know, darker themes, I suppose, but it wasn't ever like, it wasn't ever like serial killers or things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely interested in, in the kind of the darkness of human nature. What do you do to, um, stay straight in terms of like your mind straight, keeping things together, keeping, cause we talked about that in the beginning, how you're, you're sort of even keeled, you're, you know, you try not to get too upset. You try not to be overwhelmed, not spreading yourself too thin, but what do you do? What do you, uh, are you going back to karate? Like you did when you were a kid. I mean, what what are you doing physically, mentally? What is what is what, your routine? I exercise. How often? That's really. Um, I probably take one day off a week. So I'll exercise. It, it won't be excessive. I don't excessively exercise, but like I'll do cardio or I will go to a weightlifting, you know, class. Um, so I'll do that as about six days a week, sometimes a little less, depending on my course load, if I'm busy with other things or if I'm working. And how long is a class? An hour? An hour, yeah. I don't normally work out more than an hour. How do you feel when you don't do it? When you don't go I get, to the gym? Uh, like, tickly. Like, um, it doesn't feel good. There's energy that needs to be expended, and I am not doing that. So exercise is a huge part of my mental health, I think, and it always has been. I mean, I've been active since I was you know, a little kid. It's a huge, a huge part of my family's life. It's just what I learned how to do. Um, yeah. And I think mentally, I think I don't do it as actively as maybe I used to, but it's also practicing not going into like thought spirals. Mm -hmm. I'll actively pull myself out of thought spirals. I think everybody listening, we do the same thing whenever we work out or we go for a walk or we do anything that uh, we exert energy, you know, bad energy, whatever it is. We know, we see immediately that this is, this is good. Like you could see it unless like you've never worked out in your life. And the first time you're going to start, it's going to be like tough and shitty and there's nothing good about it. But the knowing how you feel, but then there's some kind of psychology where we know we're going to feel better when we do this, but we don't. And then we feel shitty. And then we wonder why we're feeling shitty. It makes a huge, huge difference. 
And then because I've been running, which I have, I've never done previously. I'm not a runner. And now I've kind of become a runner. There's an, a meditative aspect to it as well, which I think is really helpful finding. And I think that's, that is also the same thing I was talking about before finding ways not to go in thought spirals. I think running allows for the space to create like a med- meditation where, you know, you can watch thoughts come and go and you can feel your body go through tension and release. Like it's, it's like a, I think that's a good practice for me personally. Does Eric, your boyfriend, does he, does he exercise too? As much as you do? He, he doesn't right now because he's in a writer's room. Um, oh. But he does now. He didn't before. But for him, and he wouldn't mind me saying this, for him, for his mental health, it makes a, makes a huge impact in his life. His anxiety gets really intense if he's not exercising. Yeah, and you, you obviously notice it. You're like, hey, you're, you, know, you could see those things. I wish I had somebody there with me who would say, hey, go do this somebody to also be held accountable. Like you, you have to be held accountable for your own shit, but it's nice to like rely on someone else to say, get the fuck up and go for a run. You know, you're going to feel better. And if you don't, I have to sit here and deal with your bullshit. Right. In a way. I mean, and you have to deal with your bullshit. Just go for a run, go do something. I wish I had somebody here to just remind me, uh, uh, that I, yeah, that I should yeah, exercise. Well, it's hard when you're inside your own head mm-hmm. because you're dealing with yourself it's, it's really hard sometimes to get outside of yourself. So having anybody who can be like, I think you're doing this thing right now. <laughs> you can be able, you can, you can see it. Like they can shine the light on something. Um, and then how you choose to react to that is whatever. But I, yeah, I think that it does help to have, have help. It does. Are you able to, t- uh, Oh, you're pretty open, uh, with your feelings. Do you pretty much, will you feel something you to hold it in for a month and then go, Hey, remember last month when you said, what? What, last month i'm a dude i can't remember what, what i had for break you know what i mean do you tend to like bring things up like you know what this happened i just want to bring it up it bothered me a little bit are you able to do that with anybody yeah now i think now i am if we had had this conversation when i was 21 i would have said no i can't i have no idea how to talk about my feelings talk about what's bothering me even acknowledge that something is bothering me then that i have a right to have something bother me <laughs> But now I feel fairly capable most of the time of being, first of all, I can acknowledge when I'm feeling something, I can see when I'm making something up, I can address it. So it's made a big difference in my life and my relationships. I imagine I'm much easier to be around now. You've always been easy to be around, Krista. (laughs) Inside of You is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Counseling. I Love these guys. I love people that help people, you know, and, um, you know, uh, especially in this climate, we've talked about it. And obviously in the last few weeks, I've had some personal things happen and you got to talk to someone. I don't care how tough you think you are. The toughest people in the world will talk to a therapist. And to me, um, I think it's vital. I think that's what we talk about on this podcast. And if you think you're depressed, you're feeling anxious, you're freaking not alone. We are with you. Trust me, we're with you. I deal with it. We all deal with it. Don't think you're alone. But uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed. And BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who are trained to listen and help. Talk with your counselor in a private online environment, your own convenience from wherever you're comfortable. BetterHelp counselors have expertise in in many areas. Uh, I said anxiety and therapy, but grief, anger issues, self-esteem they have it covered. BetterHelp can give you access to help that may not be available in your area. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and you get matched with your counselor in under 48 hours. Easily schedule secure video or phone sessions with your therapist plus exchange unlimited messages. Thank God for that. Everything you share is confidential. You know that. You don't have to worry about anything. If for any reason you're unhappy with your counselor, you request a new one at any time, no additional charge. Join the million plus people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp counselor. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're currently recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. BetterHelp is an affordable option, and our listeners get 10% off your first month with the discount code INSIDE. Get started today at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's betterhelp.com slash inside. Talk to a therapist online and get help. This episode is brought to you by the Jordan Harbinger Show. 
a podcast, guys, that I really think you should check out, especially if you like this podcast. I think he does a great job. He's so personable. And uh, if you're a fan of high quality, uh, you know, fascinating podcast hosted by interesting people. Well, Jordan Harpinger. Uh, I recommend our listeners check out the Danny Trejo episode. I find that guy very interesting. And Jordan has a, it just gives a really incredible interview with Danny Trejo. So you should check that out. And the, uh, the Mark Cuban and Kevin Systrom interview is uh, pretty fascinating. One of the uh, founders of Instagram. You're going to want to hear that. And there's a, uh, he talks about everything. And uh, he's, like I said, he's so personable. What I like about the Jordan Harbinger show is that he covers stories like uh, just fascinating stories that I wouldn't even think of that are pretty amazing, like uh, how a professional art forger somehow made millions of dollars while being chased by the feds and the mafia. Uh, he really dives in, and it, which means it's a lot of work. Like he does a lot of research. You know, I I admire that. We really enjoy the show, and we think you will as well. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H A R B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Have you experienced any loss thus far in life in 37 years? Any loss that's been kind of like that you sort of something that, you know, because for me, I think it's been, I've had two losses in 48 years, which I'm lucky because people have, I mean, I have a friend, Ethan, who I love, who lost his parents at a very young age and it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. And you can just see the, the love he still has for them. And, um, you know, loss is something that like, uh, it, you know, can be devastating and in, in how you deal with it and how it makes you stronger. And have you had to deal with any of that? Well, I, I mean, I, my grandparents have all passed away, but I think like, my grandmother that I was closest to, she died when I was quite young. Um, and it had a big impact on my life, but I was six, you know, right. um, very different. And as, as an adult, like when it comes to the finality of loss in regards to like death, for instance, I, I haven't, I haven't had anyone very, very close to me pass in a way that was traumatic for me. Um, but I mean, I've dealt with loss in less permanent ways. Um, relationships, you know? Yeah. Loss of relationships, like multiple friendships that have proven to be, you know, really destructive in my life. Um, so things like that I've had to face and, and I think it's certainly given me a more deep experience of life. Yeah. And it's funny because the relationships, you know, you think of death when you think of life, but a relationship, it is, or, you know, it, it feels like death sometimes. I, I've had those feelings in my stomach where I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't function because of, of this, uh, of a breakup or whatever. And it's like, you know, that's, it's incredible. It can be incredibly painful, something that you have to keep in check and, you know. I think it is painful. It's just a different kind of, again, I haven't had anyone really close to me past that isn't, you know, Knock on a wood. grandparent, but the loss of death, I think is very different. I mean, you could speak to that more than I could than the loss of relationship that yeah. you're grappling with different things. Sure. All right. This is called shit talking with Kristen Krug. These are my lovely patrons and, uh, they're uh, big supporters of the podcast and they have some, this is rapid fire. So you could go as fast as you want. If you feel like you need to talk about something, here we go. This is easy. I'm bad at rapid fire. It's my worst. I like this job. spot right here. Keep their hands like that. This is like, uh, yeah, this is back it's, to it's beauty and the DM. beast here. It is. It's very, uh, what's that movie with the eyes, the hands and the eyes? Um, Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth. I love that. You know, that horror movie. And I love, I horror. love it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Go. All right. Shit talking. <laughs> Kristen Crook. Jamie C. Does Scotty really know? Scotty really know what? I'm sorry. I should know that. It's from a movie, Michael. Okay. Sorry. He, he didn't know. Okay. There you go. Jamie, he, <laughs> didn't, he really didn't know. Lisa H. I absolutely love Beauty and the Beast. Do you feel they could have ended the series better? I know it was canceled like so many other great shows, but I felt there was so much more story to tell and should have been given a proper send off. I kind of like the way we ended the show, but yeah, I think there were always more stories to tell with, with, with that, with that show. Was that a hard series to shoot? Um, yeah. I mean, it was a nighttime show. It was a beast. He was a military experiment. Oh, I saw it. Yeah. He was really good looking. Good looking guy. Yes. He's a good looking guy. Okay. Just I, well, I wanted to say it. I didn't even ask if you wanted to say it. I just, I noticed he was a 
expansive guy. <laughs> Steph, I always do that. I admire, you know, I, I'm easy. Like I had a dream about uh, Bradley Cooper last week. I woke up and I was like, wow, I dreamt about Bradley Cooper. It wasn't sexual or anything, but I just remember going, man, that's a, that's a cool guy, that Bradley Cooper. Anyway, uh, Steph, between Smallville, Burden of Truth, Edgemont, Beauty and the Beast, honestly, which role is closer to how you are as a person? I think, I think probably um, Joanna from Burden is closest to me, but I'm not as intense as her. She's really, really intense. But you also grew on each show too, so it's not really it's not an easy question because Smallville the first season, then you look at you maybe Smallville later or a show later. No, I'm definitely not Lana. No, I definitely am not her. No, who said you were? I'm not Catherine. I just think I'm probably closest to Joanna. Oh, maybe I'm like Laurel. Actually, maybe I'm like Laurel. She's from Edgemont. I mean, yeah, Edgemont. Carly H, as somebody who's naturally shy, shies away from the spotlight, how did you handle those first few months of fame on Smallville? I've talked to you about this a long time ago. And how have you learned to deal with it in the in the decades later? So, because uh, I remember, yeah. I handled it terribly. I really struggled with it. And I think part of how I've handled it, actually this kind of ties back into what we're talking about, about overwhelm. I, I kind of changed my life. I, I didn't take certain roles. I didn't do as much press. I kind of pulled myself away from the spotlight a little bit because I didn't like how famous we were when we were on Smallville. Yeah, it scared you. It wasn't for you. I wanted all of it. And, you know, Tom Did wanted you? part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I think I want, you know what it was? It was nice to be on a show finally that people were like, you know, they they looked at you and it was, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, when people were like, you know, they loved the character and I could tell the writers loved the character and the other cast members appreciated my work. It was just really nice. It was nice to get that sort of feeling of like, hey, dude, you're doing something right. You're on a, Good show, you're good. So, yeah, I mean, it was kind of nice. It's also good with people. Like, I don't think people scare you like they scare me sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Which makes it easier to deal with people paying attention to you. Yeah, I'm an attention whore. Sophie M. Hi, Kristen. Hello, Sophie. <laughs> Do you have a favorite line you got to deliver as Lana Lang? I don't even remember lines from people. I don't remember any of the lines. How about the one, Clark, you're gorgeous. I want you. I like that I don't line. I think I ever said that line. Mm -mm, you didn't say that. Lex, I really love you. That was the Lex, I love you. You're so hot. <laughs> I don't think you said that one either. Janelle B, last one. What type of books do you like to read the most? And what is your absolute favorite go-to book to read? Here she lit up. She lit up. Look at her. She's on fire. She loves reading. Hey, listen. I have been actively broadening my reading scope. So I've been getting more into science fiction fantasy which wasn't my thing, but I'm loving N.K. Jemisin. She is a genius and amazing, um, super creative and unique writer. And then I, I think I'd normally read like contemporary fiction. I live in that world. Um, but I also love, you know, going back to my olden times, I love classical literature too. So like the Bronte sisters, I really enjoyed that kind of tortured read um but th there's a book for quarantine while we're still in it for a while longer that i think is really excellent peter it's benchley's like, jaws mandel what? what sorry sorry i jumped in and said peter benchley's jaws oh. I really like um, that book. <laughs> now, what is it emily st john mandel wrote this book called station 11 and it's about um the world going into a pandemic and it escalates more than ours has and it follows a group, like a theater troupe, a Shakespeare theater troupe that goes through the United States in a caravan. And it's really complex and the characters are fascinating and it's hopeful. It's like a, a pandemic read that leaves you hopeful for humanity's future, not devastated and in despair. There's also this horror movie you should check out. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, that's all I watch. I mean, I watch a lot of horror movies. There's a movie Relic I liked. I, I liked... Uh, um, I like Hereditary. It follows. There was a new one called Host, where oh, it's a Zoom Hereditary. call. So they, they, they Hereditary is pretty good. Uh, there's a, it's a Zoom call. It's called Host. H O S T. It's new, and it's all filmed like these five girls are zooming each other, and then horror happens, and it worked. I kind of liked it. I didn't tell you this, I don't think, but um, we went to go visit uh, Eric's cousin, and actually someone I did gymnastics with for a long time, 
um, in Amsterdam. And this was a while ago now, but her partner is a director and loves horror. They both love horror. So they gave, they made a crash course. Cause I was like, I don't get it. I don't get horror. I don't like it. I don't understand it. And it was like basically a whole list of horror movies to watch from the classics through like, you know, more gory stuff to like weird. Did you watch them? Yeah, we watched like pretty much every single one. And I've come to really, I think, appreciate the form. There are things I don't love. Like I, I don't love, you know, the saws of the world, but, but I love what you can do in horror. I, especially the, I really like the older, the older alien. Movies. Like, Alien. Yeah, Please alien say that. So good. so good. And don't you love it that she's just a kick ass woman at the end? Yeah. That's great. How about, I mean, Jaws, The Shining, Exorcist, Omen. I've seen Jaws. Oh. Um, the Shining, obviously. I, I really, I mean, I love like old, like Psycho. I love. Oh, I'm telling you, that scene when he comes down with the knife in the basement at the end is one of the most horrifying moments in horror history. I, I, to this day, that scene is just incredible. It really is. Yeah. So good. I like this. I like that you're experimenting with horror. You just, you know, you maybe I'll have to start reading. All right. I guess I'm gonna have to start reading. Give me a couple of books that you think I could actually read. Maybe uh, if they have pictures or if they're less than 200 pages. Horror. What? I read a horror book. What was it? Uh, called Only Good Indians. Okay. It's in hardcover right now. I'm not sure if you would like it, like, because I don't know what you would like to read. It's pretty short, mm. but it kind of it follows um, a group of men um, who are indigenous, um, and they have some of them have left the reservation. But there's like it's a, it takes place in the states, and they did something in the past that has come back to haunt them. Is it scary? Like, tracking them all down. What? And it's scary. It's a horror, yeah. Okay, send me that. No, just email me and I'll go. I'll go get it. Okay, I'll email too. This has been fun. You know, it's funny because I know I, I, I'm sure you were thinking the same thing. You were probably thinking, "Oh, what is he going to ask me?" I mean, we talked like a long time ago, but this time I have you on film. We could see your nice face, and we could talk, and we got to talk about a lot of other things. We did. Yes, you know, we kind of delved into little things, and it was. Uh, I always love talking to you. I like talking to you too. Yeah, it's easy, right? It is easy. Yeah, because I know you don't like interviews all the time. I don't. You're correct. I don't. But I like talking to people that I know. Okay. What's that globe behind you? Where? What? Cool. What country is it on? What continent? It's not like a real. It's like old and timey. Oh, it's like uh, yeah, it's like almost like uh, what's uh, what's the old time things uh, where they were? Uh, you know, like uh, Genghis Khan and uh. It's like it's just cool. It's just cool. So, show and tell. All right. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah, she's just a good person, isn't she? Delight. She is. She's, uh, I, you know, it's just, I always, I, when you talk to someone like Kristen, I always feel like, uh, it's not that she makes me feel this way. I think just I make myself feel this way. But it's sort of like, I'm like, I've got to do better. I've got to be a better person. I've got, Kristen's got it together. You know, that's why I think I do this show because I'm hoping that people don't exactly have it together all the time. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think that, uh, that's true even for Kristen. I don't think she has it together all the time. She has yeah. her moments. They get in arguments, you know, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. in the interview, we hear this stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's nice. And it's it's all, always nice to talk to someone I've worked with and known so long. And uh, so there you have it. Another big shout out to all the patrons out there. Um, again, the Stage It show is uh, this Saturday, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Rob Danson and I are going to play... A lot of originals, covers, left on Laurel Tunes. My phone's ringing. It happens. And um, that stage, you go to stageit.com, type in Rosenbaum and Dance, and there's two shows. Get tickets. Huge prizes. You won't believe it. It's fun. A lot of virtual events coming up. And uh, the online store, inside of you online store. You, just, you can still get beach towels, sandals. Oh, I don't have the sandals out yet, though. Flip-flops. They're, they're I nice. I didn't put those up. Yeah, but uh, still got new V-neck fitted shirts for the ladies and um crew neck for the guys because guys don't want v-necks although i have friends that still wear v-necks i had a v-neck phase i I stopped that we all did yeah it's gone though i don't i don't know if it's gone i think when i had a nice chest i think i like to i don't want to get into it i don't don't have the right arrangement of hairs for it though are you not hairy no can i see your chest not at this moment no okay i'll show you later oh 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, patrons. I guess the patrons are getting the shout outs now. I do love them. Many of these names I just wrote letters to. That's true. Mm. Should we do, should we have a sort of a build up, like a drum roll for this, for the patrons now? Can you do kind of a little drum roll? Yeah. All right, here it goes. Oh yeah, here we go. And Nancy D, Mary B, Leah S, Trisha F, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko. Jill E, Brian H, Lauren G, Nico P, Angelina G, Robin S, Jerry W, Emily K, Bob B, Robert B, Jason W, Stephen J, Kristen K, not Kristen Krug, Kristen K. Maybe it is Kristen Krug. Is it possible Kristen Krug is a, no. No, we didn't talk she about it. She wouldn't be a patron. Mm. Amelia O, Allison L, Tom N, Jess J. It'd be nice if Welling was a patron. He would just give me shit the whole time. Lucas M, Raj. Emily S, CJP, Samantha M, Hamza, Hamza B, Jennifer N, no, 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 that's not Nani Arello, that's Jennifer N, Jackie P, Stacy B, Carly T, Jennifer S, Janelle B, Carrie B, Tab of the 272, not to be confused with, Tab of the 273, thank you, Kimberly E, Crystal H, Mike E, Marissa, no, 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 no. Ramira, Beth B, Chris F, San Diego M, Sarah F, Chad W, Leanne P, Rachin, it's really Rachel, but Rachin. Ray A, Maya P. I just zoomed with everybody. I had a big zoom of like 50 of the top tier members, and we all zoomed it up. It was great. And I got to see everybody's face. Oh my God, you had 50 people on one zoom? 50, and I was there for like over an hour and a half. Jeez, and it was it was awesome. it was awesome. Exhausting, but awesome. I think they were they they loved it and I loved it. It made me happy. Maya P, Maya P, Megan D, Jennifer C, Maddie S, Tiffany I, Kendrick F, Ashley E, Margie M, Thomas T, Matt W, Belinda, and Benjamin R. Lisa J, Kevin V, Robert S, Joy W, Mike W, James R, Chris H, Snow R, Noah K, Sean V, Osborne H. What, Osborne? Osborne. 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 Osborne to love you. Osborne to lick your face. Osborne. That's from Caddyshack. Caddyshack, yeah. Dave H. I, uh, again, guys, patrons, well, I couldn't do it without you. Thanks for the extra support and everybody out there listening. Just the fact that you guys listen to me uh, every week means a ton to me. I love doing what I'm doing. I love working with this guy sitting across from me. I love Bryce. Thanks to Westwood One for really uh, getting the podcast out there and, and giving us a real shot. And um, um, live your best life, you know? All right. Thanks for allowing me to be inside of each and every one of you. This has been fun.